others' opinions. We want a thoughtful and civil discourse, as he talked about. There may be a few differences of opinion in here. Also, the ground rules for this. We're not going to do follow-up questions from our people in the audience because we want to get as many questions as we can. So please try and keep your questions as succinct as possible. And we'll get through as many questions as we can in about the next 30 minutes or so. As you line up uh, for the questions, and we will have staff there, um, I'm going to ask the first question. I'm going to take moderator's privilege here, if you will. Uh, Professor Chomsky, you, you were talking about, um, towards the end, corporate influence, corporate funding, and um, the idea that the universities in the corporate eyes need to turn out commodities. MIT, your home institution, now has a new program called Open Courseware that I know is getting a lot of um, information uh, given out about it. For those of you that don't know what it is, uh, there are many courses at MIT that the materials are now available free and online for the public. Talk about that a little bit and how that may be going against that corporate idea. I think it's uh, actually one of my close friends is more or less running it. But uh, I think it's a great idea. You know, I think it's just what ought to be done. I mean, of course, that means it's available. It's available on the internet, so not only here but everywhere, all over the world. You can hear uh, leading scientists, scholars, others uh, delivering their lectures. Uh, you can hear the classroom interaction. Uh, I mean, it's not like taking a course in a in a decent, you know, in a serious university because you're not part of the interaction. Like you can't stand up and say, uh, that's wrong, better way to do it, you know, which is a, lo a large part of what real education is. Uh, it is supposed to encourage independent thought. That means challenges. And a lot of what we and everybody else is teaching is wrong. That's why you don't teach the same thing every year unless your field is dead. Uh, you, uh, uh, because you're learning. And a lot of the learning comes from what students are doing. They're part of the uh, educational process. And you don't interact with other students. I'm sure all of you know that, just from your own experience, that what's enriched your educational experience is peer interchange. You're talking with, your other, with other students, you know, arguing about things, trying to work things out together, and so on. Uh, and any, uh, like, take, uh, take my own university since I know it best, but um, if you walk around the, the floors of the departments, uh, students are talking to each other, working together, uh, writing joint papers, you know, art, and, and a lot of very important stuff comes out of that. Well, if you're watching open courseware, you're not part of that. So it is necessarily kind of passive. Actually, there are efforts being made, and it's tricky to develop modes of more interaction. And it's not impossible, but it's hard, and I hope that it'll go to that. But the general idea is great, I think. All right, I will abide by our own rules and not ask a follow-up as badly as I would like to. Let me start on uh, this side, and again, uh, let's keep our questions fairly short so we can get through as many as we can. Uh, hi, Professor Chomsky. Um, first thing I want to say is thank you for visiting the University of Arizona, and thank you for such a great talk. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask about the two documents you mentioned, the Powell Memorandum and the Trilateral Commission. Um, do you consider that the major reason for the increase in tuition, and what other factors uh, come into play? Well, I don't really know of any study of this. So I have to speculate. I mean, it's kind of surprising that there isn't, as far as I know, there isn't any study because it's a major phenomenon. Uh, but if you just look at the timing and the thinking behind it and other things that are happening in the society, it's hard to doubt that the concern about what they called on the liberal end, the failure of the institutions 
to indoctrinate the young, their phrase. Now, the, rec the failure of this, which showed up in the, active, in the civilizing effect of the 60s, it was followed very shortly, and not only by the beginning of the rise in tuitions, but by lots of other things, even university architecture. So university architecture began to change. If you look at universities that were built and designed, this is worldwide, incidentally, you know, Japan, the United States, everywhere, that are designed in the 70s and the 80s, they usually don't have public places. They don't have anything like uh, Sproul Plaza in Berkeley where students get together and uh, you know, have discussions, demonstrations, and so on. Uh, there are paths from here to there, but not places for students to get together. Uh, and I, I, that is conscious. I've talked to architects about it. Uh, and I suspect that the same is true of tuitions. Actually, it's a good, good topic to study. I don't know of any studies, uh, but it looks very plausible. And again, there, isn't, there can't be an economic reason for it, for the reasons I mentioned. It's got to be an ideological re reason. Thanks for your question. Now come over to this side. Thank you for coming, Professor uh, Chomsky. I just wanted to ask, I think a lot of us here are in that group who would say that education is for everyone. So in light of things like No Child Left Behind and the HB 2281 anti-ethnic studies, my question is about hope. What, where should we find inspiration as a lot of us being educators in here to kind of go forth with hope for education? Well, you, for one thing, there's, uh, I mean, take say Mexico. It's right nearby. As I say, we're basically in it. Uh, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a poor country, and it's not a rich country like us for reasons that have something to do with us, as you know. But anyway, it's a fact. And uh, what they do in the higher education system is quite impressive. Uh, the, actually, I should add that this uh, city college and city university, open city university in Mexico City is not old. It was instituted by uh, 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 Obrador when he was the mayor, left-wing mayor in uh, Mexico City. He started it and it's been apparently flourishing since. Uh, as I say, I visited and was pretty impressed. Uh, things like that, that's an inspiration. Or you can look at the student movements over, the, over this hemisphere. I mean, from Chile up to here, in fact, there are very lively, vibrant student movements. In Chile, it's amazing. Uh, it has just revitalized the country. There's been uh, student protests. Uh, remember, this is protests against the lingering effects of the dictatorship that we imposed on what in Latin America is called the first 9-11. Uh, it's kind of striking that people here don't know what that means, most of them. But the first 9-11, 9-11-1973, uh, by any dimension that I can think of, was much worse than what we call 9-11. Uh, uh, and uh, and not just in Chile, it had very global effect. Uh, but and, it, and the dictatorship has formally been gone for about 20 years. But there are lingering effects, uh, just as there are in Spain. There are lingering effects of the Franco dictatorship right now. And the young people protesting there, the indignados as they're called, are trying to undermine the very serious lingering, lingering effects of the dictatorship. They're very real. Well, that's Chile. And there are similar things going on through the hemisphere, in fact, abroad, and in fact, right here. Uh, uh, the, um, I mean, the protests about the uh, uh, destruction of the Mexican Studies program, for example, it's important. And uh, uh, teacher, teachers are organizing. I mean, there are a lot of pressure, you know, uh, tremendous pressures against public school teachers. You speak up, you're thrown out, and so on. But that doesn't mean that people are taking it passively. Uh, there are efforts to respond. There are the journals where people are writing about it. And uh, there are the struggles of the past. After all, we've achieved a lot. You know, this country isn't what it was 
30 years ago or 100 years ago. There's a lot more freedom, justice, rights, and so on. Again, take my own university, but it generalizes over the country. If, if you walk down the halls at M in MIT, when I got there, 1950s, uh, you would have seen uh, white males, well-dressed, very passive, very conformist, uh, doing their work, uh, often very well, but uh, that's it. That was the institute. If you walk down the halls today, it looks like this. Uh, half women, third minorities, uh, informal dress, which uh, I mean, which symbolizes informal relations, you know, and uh, a lot of uh, concerns and activism of all sorts of things. It didn't happen by magic. You know. It's happened all over the country, in many ways all over the world, and uh, that's the kind of inspiration that uh, ought to suffice. I think it goes back to the to the early days, uh, the very earliest days, way far back as you want to trace it in history. Thank you. Over on this side now. Hi, I'm Denise from Chicago. First, I just want to thank the intergenerational audience that came tonight from where I stand. It's so exciting, especially seeing all the young people here. So thank you to both of you for bringing that out. Two, I'd like to invite you, Professor Chomsky, and anyone here to Chicago, May 19th, a concert for Troubadour Woody Guthrie who emulates many of the themes that you've talked about tonight. And you can find info on the Illinois Labor History webpage, who holds the deed for the Haymarket Martyrs. My question? question, what do you think of the super PAC and the decision by the Obama administration to get into it with the, you know, you talked about lobbying, and now they've made the decision to enter that fight? Well, it's obviously a sell out, but uh, of any principle, not the first one, incidentally. Uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, there is an institutional fact that political figures just have to live with. Uh, the structure of election, the electoral system has been shredded. I mean, it always was under the effect of, uh, there was always a big effect of campaign spending. And if you want to learn about it, the best work that's done is by a, a political economist named Thomas Ferguson, his personal friend. But uh, he's, he has a book called Golden Rule, which goes back a century, uh, this, uh, studying in detail the effect of campaign spending, not only on who's elected, but on what their programs are. It goes right through the New Deal, right up to the present. He's since extended it since. And I think it's pretty convincing. It's what he calls the investment theory of politics. Uh, it treats elections as occasions in which groups of investors coalesce to invest to control the state. The campaign funding is one standard mechanism. And you know, it doesn't explain everything, it doesn't pretend that it does, but it explains quite a lot. Now that's changed radically in the last 30 years. Uh, the last 30 years, part of this whole you know, basically neoliberal assault on democracy and justice, and that's what it is, it's worldwide, but here too. A part of it has just been the sharply rising cost of elections. And, and now, since, especially since Citizens United and the super PACs, it's gone through the roof, but it's been going up steadily, and it has a very definite effect it forces political figures into the pockets of those who have the money, the private corporate sector. It's increasingly financial institutions. But incidentally, that's not only true of uh, you know, the president running for office or Congress running for office. It's even permeated the Congress. I mean, it used to be the case that if uh, positions of some, you know, some uh, authority or prestige in Congress, say chair of an important committee, uh, that used to be the result of seniority and service. By now, literally, you have to buy it. You have to pay money into the party coffers in order to qualify for a, a, a chair of a committee. Well, you can guess what the effects of that are, uh, obviously. 
and this has been enormously changed by Citizens United and the super PACs, but uh, it's a process that's always been there. Actually, you go back a century, there was a great a famous campaign financier, the most famous of the era, Mark Hanna. Uh, he was once asked, uh, what are the important things in politics? And his answer was, uh, he said, well, I can think of three things that are important. The first one is money. The second one is money. And I've forgotten what the third one is. <laughs> that was over a century ago, and it's gotten a lot more extreme. So yeah, this is a sellout on Obama's part, but if he wants to run in a multi-billion dollar election, uh, you don't have a lot of choices. It's the system that's rotten at the core, and not the choices of individuals. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Chomsky. I'm a student from South Korea, and then thank you a lot for you writing for village of Gangjong in Jeju Island. It suffers a lot from the like military base construction. But like I just want your know your opinion about the tax expenditures on the military expenditure instead of education. Instead, for instance, like Korean students are suffering a lot from the actually increasing like tuition. They almost we are heading towards the same way American students been. And then like, uh, but still the government is expending lots of money on the military instead of like educating people and for better humanity. Yeah, actually that Jeju Island uh, construction that you mentioned is something very significant. We ought to know about it. Uh, it's, uh, Jeju Island is quite significant for Korea. It was the site of a huge massacre in 1948 by the uh, US-backed uh, mostly basically fascist state in South Korea, horrible massacre. And it's, uh, the island is, uh, it's, it's been actually designated, I think, by the UN as an island of peace. It's uh, uh, trying to be an island of peace. Uh, and uh, the US and South Korea are building, a, trying to build a major a military base, major naval base uh, on, on the island, uh, oriented towards China. I think it's 500 kilometers from China, approximately. And it's part of the kind of encirclement of China, which is called containment of China, uh, to, uh, pr here it's described as protection of freedom of the seas. The Chinese see it a little differently. Uh, they, they see it the way we would see it if the Chinese Navy was building bases in the Caribbean, say, uh, we'd, we'd blow them up off the planet if they did that. But uh, the way the world is supposed to work, uh, we're supposed to be able to do it anywhere. In fact, uh, if you read the, uh, the professional literature on strategic analysis, security studies, uh, they refer to the Chinese-American naval confrontation as a classic security dilemma. Each of the two sides thinks that there's an, kind of an existential danger. They just can't give it up, it's too important. So we think that it's an existential threat if the United States doesn't control all the oceans around China. And they think it's an existential threat if we send uh, nuclear armed uh, you know, uh, super carriers into their territorial waters. That's the security dilemma, you know, what can you do? Uh, and in fact, the US is trying hard to essentially encircle China so that they can't have access to the Pacific or to the uh, Malacca Straits where a lot of trade goes and so on. Uh, Japan is part of this system. Uh, Japan's a client state. There's military bases all over Japan. Uh, the, many of them on Okinawa. This is over the strong objections of the people of Okinawa who've been trying to get those bases off for 60 years and I can't do it. If, uh, ja recently, the US basically forced a Japanese prime minister out of office because he was thinking about it. Well, Jeju Island in uh, South Korea is another case. Uh, so that's, it's, and it's really serious, it's an important issue. There's a lot of protest on the island, civil disobedience, a lot of arrests, usual uh, violence, and so on. But your general point is quite right. I mean, the 
vast military expenditures are part of the, you know, I don't think they're the main reason. Like we had vast military expenditures in the 50s and it still was uh, pre, almost free education and for a GI Bill, totally free and huge amounts of money going into the research system and so on. And now it's a, it's a burden undoubtedly, but uh, I don't, it, 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 I mean, the society has to depend, decide where you want to spend your money. You want it to spend it on classic security dilemmas in the China's territorial waters with all that that would lead to building naval bases on Jeju Island, on Okinawa and so on, or do you want to spend it building a decent society? And this, this question arises all across the board. I mean, one of the most striking cases, this doesn't involve uh, education, but it does involve survival, uh, is uh, a Canadian uh, tar sands and uh, shale oil uh, in, in, throughout the country. Uh, in Obama's uh, State of the Nation address, if you read it carefully, uh, one of the things he said was that we're now coming to a, a position where we can have a hundred years of energy independence by exploiting, you know, using high technology techniques and fracking and so on to get previously inaccessible and incidentally very dirty oil uh, with all sorts of environmental, local environmental consequences. And this is all over. Uh, there was a recent speech by the uh, president of the Chamber of Commerce, main business lobby, I forgot it, Thomas Corcoran, I think. You can find it in the internet. It's his annual speech to the business world. And the first point that he mentions, the most important point, is that we can now move to, he says, several centuries of energy independence by just tapping our own oil. Uh, you go to a, a, the most responsible and serious newspaper in the world that I know of, the London Financial Times. Uh, they devote a whole full page to a euphoric description of the possibility of the United States uh, having a century of energy independence and a century of global hegemony by uh, tapping these resources. There's only one small footnote. If we use those resources, we're finished. You know, There's no future for your children and your grandchildren. That's not discussed. Uh, you got to gain wealth for getting all but self, and that means my profits tomorrow, you know, not what happens 30 years from now to my grandchildren. And that's the <laughs> yeah. uh, Meanwhile, uh, you know, the, there are alternatives, like ultimately probably solar energy is going to be the main alternative, and it's quite striking to see what's happening to the the solar energy industry. Uh, by now, uh, about half the world's social solar panels are being produced in China. Now that's not cheap labor. It's not a labor-intensive industry. They started the way all manufacturing starts, very low-level manufacturing. Uh, manufacturing provides the incentive, the ideas, the design, conceptions and so on that lead to uh, technological advances. Uh, very common. And slowly they've been, not so slowly, they've been moving up the uh, high technology ladder. They're now producing the most advanced uh, solar cells in the world. Well, okay, that's uh, one way to use your resources. Uh, we have choices. We have plenty of choices because we're a very rich society. China is a very poor society. We're a very rich one, so we have plenty of options. We have about ten minutes left, so thank you so much for keeping your questions short, so we can get through as many. That means as I should keep my answers short. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the guest of honor. You can answer as long as you like. <laughs> yeah. uh, hello, Dr. Chomsky. I'm a member of Unidos, and our question is. <laughs> In your opinion, what are the larger implications of the decision by the TUSD Governing Board and State Superintendent John Hubertal to ban Mexican-American studies? Well, I think it's, it's a particularly ugly part of the whole attack on anything like the Enlightenment ideal of education. 
uh, in this case, uh, to destroy the diversity, uh, richness of the uh, educational system, and meaningfulness for students, and so on, for a large number of students. You know, after all, big Mexican community. So I think it's just part of the general attack on a free and creative. Uh, um, education that stimulates learning, discovery, uh, you know, enriching one's life, and so on, uh, and it's you know, and uh, trying to uh, impose indoctrination and conformity. A particularly ugly case right here, you know, uh, because of where it's happening. You know, it would be ugly anywhere, but it's particularly so right here. Thank you. Back to this side. Professor Chomsky, I, I believe I speak on behalf of almost everyone here. It's an absolute humbling honor to be learning from you in person. Thank you. Um, I'm an Iranian-American peace and human rights and environmental activist, and I'm a participant in the Iran's Green Movement a supporter of the Arab Spring movements against, the, against dictatorship, and obviously I am a, a passionate participant in the Occupy movement in this country, which I believe has already awakened incredible energy, and therefore um, I am hopeful but also fearful of what it may do wrong in order to possibly waste this last chance movement. So please share with us your wisdom about what is it that you think at this point in history the occupied movement needs to be wary of or be careful about. Well, like you, I think the Occupy movement has been quite a remarkable success, way beyond what I thought. Uh, and, and the tactic has been very effective for a lot of reasons. Uh, one effect that it's had is just changing kind of national discourse. In fact, even the terminology and imagery of the Occupy movement is now sort of mainstream. It's focused attention on serious problems, uh, inequality, uh, like somebody asked before, the purchase of elections, shredding of democracy, uh, the extraordinary power of financial institutions, which probably contribute very little, if anything, to the economy. In fact, the, the leading, uh, the most respected financial commentator in the world, I think, uh, Martin Wolf of the uh, Financial Times in London, is a very conservative, highly respected correspondent. He describes the financial institutions that have developed in the last 30 years as uh, kind of like a larva that destroys the host in which it's embedded. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, I couldn't get away with saying that, but he can, you know, and I can get away with quoting him. Uh, but uh, the, uh, and the Occupy movement has directed attention to foreclosures, you know, homelessness, a lot of problems that are there, but were kind of buried. Another major contribution it's made, in my opinion, is just uh, overcoming the atomization of the society. The people in the United, the United States are a very atomized society. People are kind of alone. You know, the ideal um, social unit from the point of view of concentrated power is a dyad, you know, you and the screen, but nothing else. Uh, that's a way to make sure that everybody's conforming. And there's a lot of that. The children, you know, the, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real disease, a pathology. And the Occupy movement's overcoming it. It's creating spontaneously communities of people who actually are reviving traditional ideals. I mean, if there were any real conservatives in the country, they'd be applauding the fact that they're reviving the concepts of solidarity, mutual support, uh, sympathy, uh, free discussion, and so on, that are just the most traditional values we have. There's been major efforts to destroy them. And that's being revived in the communities of 
mutual support and solidarity that are being created. Well, all of this is really important, I think. But now, uh, where do you go from here? Well, uh, in gen uh, first of all, I don't regard myself as any kind of an expert on tactics. I've been wrong so many times on tactical judgments that I usually shut up. But, uh, uh, so, but, but uh, and these are important judgments. The tactical judgments are those that have direct human consequences, so they're not marginal. Uh, but my, feel, my general feeling is that uh, tactics have a kind of a half-life. You know, they have diminishing returns. Uh, they may be very successful, but it sort of declines. Uh, after a while, the tactic come, there's a kind of a dynamism in which the tactic begins to relate, to overcome the purpose, uh, apart from beginning to alienate other people who you're trying to reach. So while I think that the Occupy tactic has been a great success, I think it has to be rethought and uh, moves have to be made somehow to reach out into larger communities. Uh, that's been going on in a number of interesting ways, like one of the developments in several cities, I know in New York and Boston elsewhere, has been uh, what's been called Occupy the Hood. Uh, neighborhood Occupy movements, which have to some extent integrated with the, you know, the ones that make the newspapers, uh, Occupy Wall Street, so Occupy Your Neighborhood in Brooklyn, uh, Occupy other things. Uh, and those deal with the immediate problems of the local people. And they can be very serious. Uh, I mean, it can be something that sounds as simple as getting a traffic light where kids have to cross the street. I mean, if people can achieve that, they learn you can achieve something by mutual aid and you can go on. That's what successful organizing is about. And if the Occupy movements can go in that direction, reach out to larger sections of the population, and engage the, uh, uh, the working class, which they have yet really to do, and that's very significant, uh, then I think they have great prospects. Uh, but it's not easy to do. There's going to be a lot of repression, you know, violent repression sometimes, and power systems don't fade away cheerfully. You know, they'll do what they can to control things. Uh, but I think that uh, David Hume was correct. Power is in the hands of the governed. Uh, and there's nothing, there's no weapon that the powerful have other than control of opinion attitudes, opinions, beliefs, if they can make people feel hopeless, dependent, passive, uh, atomized, okay, then you can keep power. But uh, the governed, that is the 99% in the imagery of the Occupy movement, they have the power. Uh, but you have to, they have to get organized, committed, uh, and that's the task of uh, people who want to devote themselves to this. We have time for one final question, and we'll come from this side. Um, hi, Dr. Chomsky. I met you first with Daniel Berrigan. It's a long time ago. But anyway, uh, getting back to your specific uh, expertise in linguistics, uh, it's been troublesome to me that uh, the media will use words like uh, socialism, class warfare, but we never hear fascism. And uh, from my studies of ideology, uh, state-supported capitalism, pretty much what we've been talking, or what you've been talking about, is fascism. I know words have power, and you know that too. Is are we too shy to talk about what basically almost brought the end of mankind in the last century, or is it just the media controls and you have to go to Link TV or, or um, Democracy Now, or I don't know? But they are not supported. They have to be supported by people donating to them. Isn't anyone aware of? Well, uh, the history of that word is kind of interesting. Uh, uh, fascism obviously took on bad connotations uh, in the 1940s. Uh, but if you go back, and incidentally, the same is true of other words. Like take propaganda. The term propaganda now is 
not used for information in English. It still is in other languages. If you go back to the 1920s, uh, information was just called propaganda. Uh, like uh, Edward Bernays, who I mentioned, the founder of the public relations industry. Uh, the book of his, from which I was quoting on engineering of consent and controlling the masses and so on, is called propaganda. Uh, propaganda is just what you do when you try to control beliefs and attitudes. Well, since the 1930s and the 40s, and can't use that term anymore for its uh, obvious connotations. Fascism is a very interesting one. And we can learn a lot about ourselves from looking at its history. Uh, before the Second World War, before the United States got into the Second World War, 1941, uh, fascism was not regarded particularly critically. In fact, there's a very important book I'd urge you to read if you haven't, called uh, Business as a System of Power by one of the great political economists, Robert Brady, Veblenite economist. Uh, it's about the spread of fascism through the industrial world. Uh, he points out that in every country, all of the industrial countries, there are uh, developments of basically fascist character. And he discusses them and uh, uh, you know, it's perfectly understandable. He was quite right, in fact. Different, um, there's nothing inherent in fascism that says you have to have gas chambers. That's a special thing that developed. And in fact, say, uh, Mussolini's fascism was very highly regarded in the United States. Remember, that's pre-Nazi. Uh, so uh, uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, uh, he described uh, Mussolini as that admirable Italian gentleman. I mean, as late as 1939, he was praising uh, Mussolini, saying, well, he's been kind of misled by Hitler, but basically doing the right thing. Uh, in, uh, uh, when fascism was instituted in Italy, and it was pretty ugly, uh, it was praised across the board in the United States. Uh, business investment shot up. It also did after Hitler came in. Uh, our, uh, there was a Fortune magazine, the main business journal, uh, had an issue in, I think, 1932. Uh, the title, you look at the front page cover, the t uh, big letters, it says, the WAPs are unwapping themselves, meaning the WAPs are finally doing something right. You know, they got a fascist government which works, and we like that. Uh, people on the left were praising it. Uh, the same, same with Nazism. I mean, as late as 1938, uh, Roosevelt's main advisor, Sumner Wells, uh, went to uh, the Munich conference. That's the conference which tore up Czechoslovakia. Uh, and he came back uh, full of praise for the uh, uh, Nazi moderates uh, who were going to help us usher in a a new um, era of peace, uh, they're the moderates, uh, you know, kind of protecting civilized values from the extremists of the right and left and so on. I mean, George Kennan, who's very much honored and respected now, there's a major biography that just came out full of praise. If you take a look at his actual record, uh, he was the American consul in Berlin right through 1941. He was withdrawn from Pearl Harbor. And he was sending back uh, diplomatic correspondence to Washington saying, you shouldn't be so hard on the Nazis. They're doing some things wrong, but basically uh, we can do business with them. They're the right kind of people. Uh, well, a couple of years later, you couldn't talk about fascism that way. The fascism meant uh, crematoria, you know, gas chambers, and so on. So you stop using the word. But your point is correct. As a social and political order, uh, Robert Brady knew what he was talking about. There are elements of this kind of state capitalist order all over the industrial world taking different forms. Well, thank thank you, you all for all of your questions and for your attention.